This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory, and will be mostly about fields in number theory. So um, we we'll first quickly just recall that a field is just a ring. So you remember a ring is something with addition, subtraction, um, and multiplication and a zero and a one satisfying the usual rules of high school algebra. The difference between a ring and a field is that a field also has division. So we can define a divided by b if b is not equal to zero. So we recall <coughs> typically examples of fields are the rationals or the reals or the complex numbers. And in this course, perhaps the most important example of a field is the ring of integers modulo pz for p a prime. And what we're going to do is to generalize several of the theorems we've proved about this field here, the integers modulo p, to um, more general fields or sometimes just more general finite fields. Um, so um, we recall that over any field, if we've got a polynomial f x with coefficients in a field k, um, then f has at most n roots, where n is equal to the degree of f. So we proved this earlier when f is the field of integers modulo p, and the only property we used was that this was a field, so um, th th this works fine for any other field. Um, now let's go through a few theorems um, that we had about number theory and see how they generalize. The, the, the first theorem we had is that p has a primitive root. This is for p prime. Um, what this means is a primitive root g is an element such that g has order um, exactly p minus 1 in z modulo pz star. So, so every element, every non-zero element modulo p is, is a power of this primitive root g. And um, another way of saying this is that this group here is cyclic. So a cyclic group is just one such that, 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 that there's some fixed element which could be called a primitive root or a generator such that every element is a power of it. And um, now we want a generalization of this to fields. So suppose um, k is a field and g a finite subgroup of um, k star. Th th this means the non-zero elements under multiplication. Um, so, for example, if k is a finite field, we could take g to be all non-zero elements because that is um, a, a finite subgroup. Then g is a cyclic group. So this generalizes the theorem about a primitive root to all fields. It just says that any finite subgroup of, uh, of the multiplicative group of a field is, is always cyclic. And the proof is much the same as for uh, 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 as we gave that, that P has a primitive root. The key point is that any polynomial x to the d minus 1 equals 0 has at most d roots. Here we're using the, the property that we're working over a field because if you're working over something that isn't a field this could have more than d roots. So any element g has at most d elements of order d for any integer d greater than greater than 1. And um, this was the property that we used um, to show that the integers modulo p had a primitive root. Um, and exactly the same argument shows that g is cyclic. So um, you remember that the, the key point is we use the, the fact that the sum of the divisors of n of Euler's phi function of d is equal to n, and then did a careful counting argument of the number of elements of each given order in g, and found there must be some elements of uh, whose order was equal to the order of, of g. Um, um, so, uh, for example, if, if k is finite, 
This implies the multiplicative group of non-zero elements of K is a, a cyclic group. Um, of course, if K is infinite, an infinite field, the group of um, non-zero elements is usually not a cyclic group. In fact, it's never a cyclic group for K infinite. Um, another example might be you take the complex numbers um, and then you notice that, that, that there are several subgroups of complex numbers. For instance, we could take the fifth roots of one um, and the fifth roots of one form a cyclic group of order five. And th the same thing happens if you change five to any other number. Um, in, in fact, this is sort of where the name primitive root comes from for finite fields, because a primitive root in the complex number is a root of one. Um, so a primitive nth root is a root of one of order exactly n. And this is exactly the same for finite fields, because a primitive root is a root of one of order p minus one. Um, so um, next, there's a very close analogy between um, the integers and the polynomials over a field. So you remember the integers form a unique factorization domain where every number can be written as a product of primes. And we saw last lecture that the ring of polynomials over a field is also a unique factorization domain and every polynomial is a product of irreducible polynomials. That's a polynomial that can't be written it's not a zero or a unit and can't be written as a, a product of other polynomials. So primes and irreducible polynomials are really almost the same thing. And now for the integers, if we took the integers modulo um, a prime, this was a field. And if we take the ring of polynomials over a field and take kx over f times k of x, where f is an irreducible polynomial, then this is also a field. And um, proof of this is much the same as for the integers. You can just sort of use Euclid's algorithm to find inverses. And an awful lot of stuff we've, we've talked about, about the integers modulo p in number theory, a lot of it generalizes to these um, fields here. Um, well, um, so um, let's have some examples of this. Um, we can, in fact, take k to be one of these fields here. So, so suppose we take k to be z over 2z. Then we found some irreducible polynomials last lecture. So, so we had some irreducible polynomials like x squared plus x plus 1, x cubed plus x plus 1, and there's even x to the 4 plus x plus 1, um, or x to the 4 plus x cubed plus 1, x cubed plus x squared plus one are several examples. So we can take one of these polynomials and we can form a new field. For instance, we can take the polynomial um, z over 2z, take polynomials over this and quotient out by all multiples of the polynomial x squared plus x plus one. And the elements of this will be things of the form a plus b times x with a, b in z modulo 2z. So there are four elements of this field. We've constructed a little field of order four. Um, you notice this is very um, analogous to the construction of the complex numbers. With the complex numbers, we just take r of x modulo x squared plus one. And this is also a field of complex numbers whose elements can be written as a plus bx for x squared equals minus one here. x squared is not minus one, it's equal to x plus one. Um, uh, so, um, um, th this is an example of something called a finite field. So let's say a bit more about these. Um, so finite fields turn up a lot in number theory. And um, this is, of course, just a field of finite order. And we have some examples of them. First of all, z modulo pz is obviously an example. And then we, we also have z modulo pz, and then we take polynomials over this, modulo some irreducible polynomial f. Um, so um, we've had some seen some examples of order um, 4 or 8 or 16. You, you notice the number of elements 
is just equal to p to the power of the degree of f because the elements are just things of the form a0 plus a1 um, x all the way up to plus a n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 where um, n is the degree of f. That's because any polynomial is a multiple of f plus a polynomial of degree less than f. And the number of these is just p times p times p and so on, which is p to the power of the degree of f. Um, um, so whenever you can find an irreducible polynomial over a finite field of order p of degree n, we, we've constructed a, a finite field of order um, p to the n. Um, conversely, any finite field has order um, p to the n for some prime p and some n greater than or equal to 1. And um, the, the reason for this is as follows. If f is a finite field, We look at the multiples 0, 1, 2, and so on of 1. And since the field is finite, one of these must be equal to 0. So we must have n equals 0 for some n. And for, for the, the, the minimum value of n with this property, with, with n equals 0 in the field, is a prime. Because other, if it was a factor of two numbers a and b, which was smaller than n, then one of these would have to be zero. So we see that the finite field must actually contain the field z modulo pz for some p. And then um, we forget that f, we now forget that f is a field, and just think of f as being an abelian group. Um, and you know it's an abelian group, but it, you can also multiply by elements of this field. So f is a vector space over the field z modulo pz. And it must be a finite dimension. So suppose the dimension is n. That means all you can pick a basis and all its elements can be written in the form a1 up to a n for a i in z modulo pz, as usual for a vector space. So the order is p to the n. Um, so any, any finite field is order p to the n. And conversely, we can um, find finite fields of order p to the n by taking a suitable irreducible polynomial. Um, in fact, all finite fields come like this. Um, we can see this by, by looking at the structure of a finite field. So f is going to be a finite field. And then we recall we showed that um, the multiplicative group, that's all non-zero elements under multiplication, is cyclic. Um, so it has a generator, G. Um, and if F is, so if F is the minimal polynomial with G as a root, um, then um, F, it's not difficult to see that F must then be equal to Z modulo PZ um, quoted it out by all multiples of f. So um, any finite field is, is generated by a root of some irreducible polynomial because we can just pick a generator and find a polynomial that is a root. So, so all finite fields um, arise uh, from irreducible polynomials over, um, over uh, the finite field of order p. Um, the additive group, so, so let's look at the um, group group of f under addition is usually not cyclic um, unless f is equal to z modulo p z. Um, it seems to be quite a common mistake to assume that it's 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 just the cyclic group z to the modulo p to the n z, but that, that that's simply false. Um, in fact, it's sort of obviously false because um, this is actually a vector space. So it must actually be isomorphic to a sum of copies of the additive group z modulo pz. And in particular, all elements have order p under addition.
Um, so, 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 so don't 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 go around making the standard mistake about finite fields. That multiplicative groups are cyclic. Their additive groups are usually not cyclic. Um, then we have Fermat's theorem. Um, so Fermat's theorem for z modulo p z just says that x to the p is congruent to x mod p. And the same is true for that the, 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 we can do something similar for all finite fields. So you know the order of the finite field is p to the n, and we have that x to the p to the n is equal to x for all x in the finite field f. And the reason for this is that if x equals zero, this is obvious. And if x is not equal to zero, then x is in the multiplicative group of f star. So x to the power of um, x to the order of the multiplicative group is equal to one by Lagrange's theorem, which just says x to the p minus p to the n minus one is equal to one. And putting these together shows that this is always true. So, so Fermat's theorem works for finite fields, except you've got to um, put in the order of the finite field in the exponent here. Um, now we saw earlier that if we work with the integers modulo p, then x to the p minus x factorizes as x times x minus one times x minus two times x minus p minus one. That's mod p. We can do something similar over any finite field. We find that x to the p to the n minus x factorizes as the product over all alpha in the finite field of x minus alpha. And the proof is much the same. We notice that all these, all elements alpha of the finite field are roots of this polynomial by the generalization of Fermat's theorem. So this polynomial must be divisible by this polynomial. And then we notice they both have the same degree and they have the same leading coefficients. They must actually be the same. So, so this always holds in um, the ring of polynomials over any finite field. And then you remember we had several applications of this identity for finite fields. You can do something sim. Sorry, we had several applications of this modulo p and these applications all have analogues for any finite field. Um, for example, we used this polynomial to find all roots of a polynomial modulo p. And um, by fiddling around with it a little bit, we could even factorize all polynomials with coefficients in modulo p. And if we use this polynomial instead, we can find roots of a polynomial over any finite field and factorize polynomials over a finite field. Um, we can also, um, you remember there was an analogue between the integers and um, polynomials modulo p, they were both unique factorization domains and so on, and we can also have um, analogues of theorems about z become theorems about uh, 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 about this ring here. For example, we've already had Fermat's theorem z modulo p in z modulo p z we have x to the p um, is congruent to x and we notice that if we take this ring here z modulo p z of x modulo f irreducible then x to the p to the n is congruent to x where n is equal to the degree of f. Um, now, uh, so that's Fermat's theorem. We also had Euler's theorem, which says that in z over mz, we have x to the phi of x is congruent to 1, provided x is co-prime to m. So what would the analogue of this be um, for polynomials over a finite field? Well, this time we would take polynomials z modulo pz of x. So we take polynomials with coefficients in z and we modulo over any polynomial f which need not be irreducible. Um, and what can we say about this? Well we can still say that x to the order of the non-zero elements 
um, is equal to one in this string here. Um, and now you remember we had a Chinese remainder theorem which says that z modulo m n z is isomorphic to z over m z times z over n z. So that's just the Chinese remainder theorem. And the Chinese remainder theorem works also for polynomials over a finite field, or for that matter, for polynomials over any field. If we if we take z modulo p z x over f times g then this is isomorphic to z over pz of x modulo multiples of f times z over pz of x modulo g, provided f and g are co-prime. And the proof of this is actually just a special case of the Chinese remainder theorem for arbitrary rings that we had earlier. Um, then we had Wilson's theorem which said that p minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 mod p. And this is for the field z modulo pz, and it just says the product over all alpha not equal 0, um, alpha in z modulo pz, is equal to minus 1 in z modulo pz. And the same works for, for, for all finite fields. So the analogue for finite fields says that if f is a finite field, we can take the product of all elements of the finite field that are non-zero. And this is again equal to minus 1 in the finite field f. And um, we sort of already proved this because um, this is true or groups where minus 1 is the only element of order um, 2. And for any finite field, um, minus 1 is, um, again, the only element of order 2, uh, because that would be a square a square root of 1 and a field only has two square roots of 1, which are 1 and minus 1. Um, if the finite field is as is of characteristic 2, in other words, 2 is equal to 0, you, you need to be slightly more careful about this, but in that case, minus 1 is actually equal to plus 1, so this is still true. Um, um, so I'll just mention... Um, some more results. Um, we said that any finite field is um, of the form um, z modulo pz of x modulo an irreducible polynomial f. And at first sight there seem to be lots of different finite fields of a given order. For instance there are two polynomials um, of irreducible polynomials of degree 3 over the field of order 2, which are x cubed plus x plus 1 and x cubed plus x squared plus 1. So we seem to have two different fields um, of order 8. But in fact, these fields are really isomorphic. Um, in general, there is exactly one finite field of order um, p to the n for any prime p and any n greater than or equal to 1. Um, the proof of this uses, uses a bit more field theory than I really want to cover in this course. Um, I'll, I'll just mention the key point. Um, the finite field of order p to the n is something called a splitting field. of the polynomial x to the p to the n minus x. So for, to find out what a splitting field is, you need to go to a course on algebra, and then there's a theorem in algebra that says splitting fields exist and are unique, and that gives you existence and uniqueness of finite fields of order p to the n. Um, I should, um, um, so um, that's all I want to say about fields in number theory. Um, next lecture will be on um, uh, quadratic reciprocity, which tells you um, whether or not a number is a square modulo p.